Amen. Amen. We're wrapping up our series Lost and Found this morning, and I'm so excited. We've been in Luke chapter 15. In week one, we asked the question, uh, do you see what I see? Uh, Luke 15 starts with the Pharisees and scribes grumbling because Jesus is receiving tax collectors and sinners and eating with them. They are the people who were the obstacle of progress to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were upset with Jesus because he was with joy, it's celebrating intimately with them over food, and so they grumble. And Jesus tells a series of three parables that were one story to make a distinct point. And that point was who all people are. Do you see what I see? And with the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus showed ownership. These are mine. With the parable of the lost coin, he showed the value of all people, that they are priceless and irreplaceable. And through the parable of the lost son, he showed the connection of relationship that every human being is a child. And so do you see what I see? Jesus says, if you saw what I see, you would feel how I feel and you would do what I do. And, and what he saw was in every human eye, set of eyes is my irreplaceable child. That was week one. Last week, we looked at the kind of second layer down in the, par- in the parable of the prodigal son, the question of worth or worthy, and how both of these boys were thinking about their relationship with their father based on their worthiness. The prodigal realized his unworthiness to be called a son, you'll remember, and the older brother argued his worthiness to receive good things from his father, and the point of the passage was that it's not about your worthiness, it's about your worth. And our worth is established in the fact that God would send and give his son in exchange for us. Something's only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. And so we saw that it's not about worthiness, it's about worth. Well, we're not actually going to read the parable of the prodigal son or any of Luke chapter 15 today, but I do want to encapsulate it for you. We've obviously been very familiar with it, and it's one of Jesus' most famous parables and one of the most famous uh, chapters in the whole Bible. And so in this story, we have the, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. The lost son comes home, is received by his father into loving arms, which we love to just focus on how God receives people back to himself. But then it doesn't end there. It ends with the father going out to the older brother who's angry and refuses to go in. And the last line, the father says, we, it was fitting that we celebrate. Why? Because your brother... He says, the relationship, your brother was dead and is alive, was lost and is found. And then chapter 15 ends. And it ends there on purpose because we don't know if the older brother decided to have compassion, empathy, repentance, and move toward his father and toward his brother or not. And this was, this is kind of the application that Jesus left to the Pharisees and scribes. But Chapter 15 fits into a whole section that the author, Luke, is building up to that ends in chapter 19 and verse 10, where he places the verse that is the the summary verse, the main point of the whole story, and you know it if you grew up in church, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And so this set of parables is the kind of the intro into what is going to conclude with the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. And so this morning's title and our last sermon in this series is Just Come Home. Can somebody say Just Come Home? Just Come Home. There's not many ways that I relate to Jesus. When I read the Gospels, I'm always caught off guard by Jesus and I'm I'm amazed and I marvel at Jesus and I wanna be like Jesus, that's why I'm a follower of Jesus. But there's one way that I can totally relate to Jesus, and that is on the confusing nature of where is he from. I get this a lot because I mentioned I grew up in New Smyrna Beach, and so people think I'm from New Smyrna Beach, but I'm not. My family moved here from just outside Washington, D.C. in College Park, Maryland. And oftentimes I'll mention that I came from Maryland, or I grew up in Maryland, spent my childhood in Maryland. People then assume that I'm from Maryland, but I'm not. I was actually born in California. (laughs) I just lost some of you. You're like, I'm out. That was it. I was born in uh, San Diego County in uh, December of 1981, and I was quickly uh, ushered from California after my parents' conversion back to Maryland, where they're from, and I spent uh, eight years of my life there and then moved to New Smyrna Beach. 
And so I'm from California, and I'm from Maryland, and I'm from New Smyrna. You see, Jesus was from Nazareth. That's where his family was from, but he wasn't born there, was he? He was born where? In Bethlehem because of the situation surrounding uh, the registration and the census. And so he ends up being born in Bethlehem, which fulfilled prophecy, but that's not where he was from. That's where his ancestors were from on his dad's side, his earthly father's side. But he wasn't from Bethlehem, but he was born there. But he didn't grow up in Bethlehem or Nazareth, did he? Where did he grow up? Egypt. He, his parents took him on a flight to Egypt to avoid the edict of Herod, who was trying to have him killed by a genocide, killing all the babies to and under. And so he was born in Bethlehem, and he grew up in Egypt, and then he ended up in Nazareth, where he was from. So me and Jesus, we connect. <laughs> it's all very confusing. It's funny, though, um, as I reflected on the idea of just coming home, that question kind of arose in my mind. Where is home? Where is home for you? Where is home? Um, it's funny. I, we moved around a lot on top of those three places we lived. We lived in different houses. There's one house that I, I have like my earliest childhood memories, and it felt the most like home in College Park, Maryland, on Autoville Drive. And um, I have very few pictures of our family at that house. And I don't think we lived there but for a couple years. But for whatever reason, that, that house seemed like home to me. And when my parents moved us from Maryland to New Smyrna, and I, we started living in New Smyrna, it didn't feel like home. Every time we go back to Maryland for Christmas or to visit, that's what felt like home. And it's funny, not funny, but interesting. One of those Christmas vacations, we were driving home from church, the church that we had gone to before we moved to New Smyrna, and my dad just automatically, instead of driving to my grandmother's where we were staying for the Christmas vacation, he got off the highway to that house, got off the beltway to that exit. Have you ever done that? Have you ever accidentally driven to the wrong house because you used to live there? So he pulls off the highway and he starts heading that direction. And he's like, oh my gosh, that's so weird. Out of like habit, he headed to the old house. Well, when we get there, uh, we see smoke. And we, we're like, that's so crazy. It looks like it's coming from our neighborhood. And we drove to the house to find our house on fire. And we got to watch it burn to the ground. And that's when New Smyrna started feeling like home to me. That's, <laughs> that's, how, that's how it happened. After, after that, I thought... Yep, this doesn't feel like home. (laughs) Something about that where home feeling is, oftentimes we connect with it when things go really south. And I heard somebody say at home is where the heart is. Sometimes when things get hard, when we kind of hit the bottom or things don't go the way that we planned or we experienced something we weren't expecting, there's this impulse to just to go back home. Where you're loved, where you're accepted, where someone else will take care of you. And that's uh, element of this story. We see it obviously in the return of the prodigal. He comes to his senses. When he came to himself, Luke writes, and he thought about the situation he was in versus what it would even be like to be a hired hand at his dad's house. He just wanted to come home. And so the idea of just coming home is, is, in, is in the parable. And yet, at the end of the parable, when the father goes out to entreat the older brother who self-righteously looks at the younger brother and is angry because he's being celebrated and is upset for the way that he's acted and is angry at the father for receiving him and really epitomizes the grumbling, questioning attitude of the, of the religious elite of Jesus' time, he's left out in the cold with this, with this kind of entreaty and, and an invitation to the older brother. We don't know what he does. Jesus doesn't fill in the story because it's there that we answer the question, will we come home? Well, whether you can connect with the rebelliously lost or the religiously lost, the heart of God is always to just come home. You see, these passages are very helpful for us to reflect on because they have a very obvious point when you take them in their context, but they're also part of something bigger. I alluded to that because this is chapter 15, verse 1, all the way to 1910 is a big section. And if you read it that way, you'll see all the pieces pop right out at you. But Luke is also writing a whole book. It's a gospel, and it's about who Jesus is and what he did. And what he did is connected to who he is and what Luke is trying to convey to all people, particularly Gentiles and those on the margins of society, is who Jesus is to them. And so this story given by Jesus for a purpose to the Pharisees who were grumbling is also being used by Luke to make a point about who Jesus is. I talked about this last week, the rule of three. 
We just like three. We love everything that's one, two, three. It's the easy series for human beings to connect with. And it's, it's used in literature. So we mentioned uh, the three little piggies, right? And you have these three little piggies, and they're the same, same, same. And then the first two experience something. They have a little variation, but they have the same outcome. He huffed and he puffed and he blew their house down. And then the third one, different outcome, right? Same thing with Goldilocks and the three bears. Goldilocks wanders in. This porridge is too hot. This porridge is too cold. This one is just right. This chair is too big. This chair is too hard. This chair is just right. Three little beds, right? And so you have this two are the same, but different. And then the third is different. You see that? So there's a comparison and a contrast. And so I mentioned last week that we could call this the, the lost sheep and the lost silver and a man had two sons. Because there is a lost son, but that's not the point. And there's actually two lost sons. And yet Jesus is making even a deeper and more subtle point still. And that point is that not only should that older son have not been angry and refused to go in to celebrate the return of his brother, but like any good Jewish boy in a family in the first century, he would have seen it as his responsibility to go searching for his brother. Do you see that in the first parable, there's a shepherd who goes to seek out and find his sheep? And in the second parable, there's a woman who gets a candle and sweeps and searches until she finds her silver. And yet in the third parable, who goes seeking? Nobody. We get a picture of the the heart of God to welcome anybody back. Just come home. That's what this parable is about. Just come home. But I'm dirty and I'm filthy and I, 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 I ruined our relationship. Just come home. I squandered all the wealth. I have nothing. Just come home. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just come home. Do you see the father's heart? And yet there is no one seeking. And here Luke begins to set up what he is going to make very clear in the pronouncement of Jesus in Luke chapter 19 in verse 10. Would you look there with me? Luke 19. And we'll back up to verse 1. You're probably familiar with this story as well. He, speaking of Jesus, entered Jericho. If you know a little bit of Bible history, you'll know the significance of that space. And was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. We know that Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he was seeking, somebody say seeking. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was about to pass by that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Those words sound familiar? And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Familiar again? He has gone into the, to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood short and proudly. And said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The point of the parable of the prodigal son is made by the declaration of who Jesus reveals himself to be to Zacchaeus. What's missing in this, these three stories is a seeking son. And it's about the identity of who Jesus truly is. Now, you can study the Bible and read it through. You should read it Genesis to Revelation. You should try to read it once a year or two over and over and over and over again. 
I, I engage with people. I'm always trying to persuade people to consider Jesus and to consider the scriptures. And I'll, I'll, I'll have conversations with skeptics, and they'll say this to me, and it drives me crazy. They say, I've read the Bible. <laughs> and, I, and I always wonder, like, what do, you, what do you mean? Like, you read it? Like, you really, like, read, like, you read the Bible? Like, you read the Bible? Like, cover to cover, you read the Bible. Because I know Christians who lived and died and didn't do that. You read the Bible. Or do you mean you've read in the Bible, read parts of the Bible, or you've read a Wikipedia article about the Bible? So what do you mean? So here's the thing. We are, we are the people of the book. Do you know that? So we are in the Bible. We're, we're the people who study the Bible and read it again and again and again and again and again. And it is life to our spirits. And it's always speaking. And it tells us things in the future that we weren't ready to hear in the past. And so keep reading your Bible. I don't care where you start, or where you turn. Just don't stop reading your Bible. And when you read your Bible, when you... When you encounter Jesus in the scriptures, stuff will start to click to you. Do you know the place Jericho? When you read in the Old Testament about Jericho, what was Jericho? It was the first place the people of God had to face conquest under the leadership of Joshua after coming out of the wilderness with Moses. Do you know this? In the story, I was talking to some friends a couple weeks ago and we were talking about manna from heaven. We were talking about how amazing it must have been to have manna, literally just, it's raining cornflakes. You got, you got no farming going on, and God's just feeding everybody with this sweet, flaky stuff that they can make bread with miraculously. And we're thinking about how amazing it was day after day, month after month, year after year, God's feeding his people in the wilderness with manna. And then I, one day it just kind of hit me. Can you imagine what it was like the day that stopped? Can you imagine the first day you woke up to go get your manna with your manna bags and there's no manna? That would be kind of a freaky day. If you grew up your whole entire life with food from heaven, and now there's none. But you know that God led his people not only through the wilderness, but then into the conquest of Canaan and the leadership of Joshua. And the first place that happened was at Jericho. And it was the first victory of the Israelites who took the city without a sword or shield. It's about the miraculous provision of God to do the impossible. And it's here that Jesus has this encounter with Zacchaeus. Now, we were told that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, which means he was the big boss. And so he, he bid to Rome to have that region, and it was a very wealthy region. And so he, would, he paid Rome something to have the right to tax those people, and he got rich taxing those people and all of their goods. And so he paid to Rome, and, and so he was colluding with the oppressive government, and that's why he was hated by the Jews, but he's very rich. And he wants to see Jesus. He's seeking Jesus. It's very interesting that we find Zacchaeus seeking Jesus. But what does he know about Jesus? Very little. Just what he's heard. He, he wants to see Jesus to kind of see who Jesus is. What, who is this guy everybody's talking about? You ever wonder why Jesus isn't physically described anywhere in the Bible? Don't you wonder what he looked like? We know more about Zacchaeus and what he looked like than Jesus. We don't know if Jesus was tall or short or good looking or like me. We don't know. <laughs> we, we, we don't know if he was easy on the eyes or not. And so here's Zacchaeus just trying to get a peek. But what he encountered was who Jesus really is. He's the all-knowing son of God. You see, Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus, but what he didn't know is that Jesus was already seeking him. Some of us, that's our story too. We, something came alive in our spirit and we got hungry. We got hungry in our spirit and we started searching and we started looking for answers and the world view that we grew up with didn't make sense. And so this, that can't be and that can't be and these pieces don't fit and I'm going through this thing and now I'm trying to figure it out. And so you drag yourself into church and you're, trying to, you're reading the Bible and you're asking questions and, and, and then you, you meet Jesus and he transforms your heart and mind instantly and forgives you and changes the way you feel about everything and begins to alter your relationships and empower you and you begin to see the world in new ways. And there's a part of us that feels like, I found Jesus. But the truth of the matter is, he wasn't lost, you were. But he starts to draw us with what we hear about him and the impact he's had on other people and the good news we hear about who he is. And so if you're hearing truth about who Jesus is, then you become like Zacchaeus. You want to get a peek. But what you find is that when you look in his direction, he already knows your name. Zacchaeus! You follow me on Facebook? How, how do you know me? Maybe he's thinking, oh no, he knows me. I'm infamous. I'm infamous, Zacchaeus. I'm the... I'm the one everybody knows about. And so he says, Zacchaeus, and he doesn't get charged. No, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house. Do you know that Jesus 
allows every single person just to come back home. That's why we want Christ Church to be a house where everyone feels like they can come, no matter what happens. No matter, no matter what shape they're in, no matter what they've done, no matter how, go- how south everything's gone, no matter who hates them, they have a home, you can always just come home. But when Jesus was on the earth, it wasn't good enough for him to send out an invite and say, everyone's welcome. He said, I'm coming to your house. And don't you love that Jesus doesn't mind? He says, I'm staying at your house. That seems like not very polite. You wouldn't do that, would you? Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm coming to your house for lunch today. (laughs) Oh, no, you're not. (laughs) You just gotta love Jesus. He says, "I, I came here to seek and save that which is lost. My irreplaceable child, Zacchaeus, you are one of mine. And so I'm coming to your house. You thought you were seeking me, but it turns out I'm, I'm seeking you. And he received him joyfully. And when everyone still continues to grumble because of who Jesus is seeking out and eating with and staying with, here we have this interaction where Zacchaeus says, behold, Lord. And so there's an acknowledgement of his authority, his power, that he is the one to be followed and trusted in. He says, half of my goods I give to the poor. You know, I hear a lot of preachers talk about how this is a, a moment of repentance. And he's saying, I will do these things in the future. And so he's had a heart change but I don't know that that's the case. And I I tried to find this over and over and over again. And this is one of those things where I couldn't find a conclusive answer. I looked at it. I looked at the verbiage in the original language. And I'm telling you, the way it reads to me, he's describing how he lives, not what he'll do different. It's in this active, present active indicative. He's describing to Jesus the condition of his heart. He's saying, I give half of my goods to the poor. And he probably did. Probably living on 50% of his income was plenty of money. And he may have been one of the most generous benefactors in all of Jericho and maybe to the point where no one knew because he was giving in secret. It's possible. He also says that I restore fourfold anything I have defrauded. Now, who would do that? And you think about this for a second. If this guy says he's going to give fourfold back to anybody who's defrauded and he's gotten wealth by defrauding people, he's literally just divested himself to zero and he's going to run out of money before he gives people back what they... Or, oh, do you see that? So my mathematical, statistical brain is saying, that's actually impossible. Any of you guys had an experience like that recently? Are you watching something happen that's mathematically impossible? <laughs> what? <laughs> so what is he saying? He says, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anything, I restore it four, fourfold. This is a reference to Exodus chapter 22 and verse one. If you steal a sheep, You have to give back a sheep times four. This is a penalty for thieving in the Old Testament. This is his way of, I believe, saying, I'm not out to defraud anybody, and if I have, I find out about it, I make it right, and I make it right the way God said. And so maybe this is him having a moment of contrition. Maybe this is him having a change. Or maybe this is him saying, I'm doing my best to do what I'm supposed to do, even though I look and I'm treated and ostracized. And are we all in that? position. Aren't we all who are seeking Jesus, who are part of his kingdom, who have an identity, who know what's right, but know where we're living with a foot in both worlds, and we're not in and we're not out, and some people treat us terribly because of what we believe and think and how we act, and yet we're trying to do right by other people, and we don't know that it's enough, and I think Jesus is looking at Zacchaeus and seeing a person straddling both worlds. And you know what he says to him? Just come home. Just come home. Just come home because it's not in you figuring it out. It's not you keeping the law. It's not you colluding with Rome. It's not what other people think about you. It's not how you feel about yourself. It's who I see you to be and who I say you are and what I've done to bring you back and the change you need. You can't do yourself. You can't figure it out mathematically. You can't give enough money away to feel better. You can't can't make everything right that you've done wrong. You'll never be able to get there. You need what only I can give you, and that's to be reconnected to your Father in heaven. And just like there was no son seeking Zacchaeus, the Pharisees grumbled that Jesus would even talk to him, let alone eat with him, let alone receive him. And Jesus says to him, just just come home. And how do you know this? Why? The son of man came to seek and save that which is lost. And if you were reading in your Bible and you read past Joshua and the battle of Jericho and you get into one of the major prophets and you're bogged down in the middle of Ezekiel and you have no idea what the place names are and what's going on and this imagery is weird, but you get to chapter 34 and verse two and you see that phrase, son of man, son of man. The son of man came to seek and save the lost. This is Jesus' favorite way of talking about himself in Luke. He called himself the son of man 25 times in Luke's gospel. Did you know that? And son of man was a way people talked about someone else like we might say, dude. Anybody say dude? So I say dude. A lot. 
If you're a male to me, you're a dude. I don't call girls dude, that's disrespectful. But dude, I say dude, he's a dude. Um, but if I say the dude, who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> the big Lebowski, right? The dude abides, the dude, the dude. So there's one, the dude, but you can just say dude. Well, so son of man was a way of just saying just a dude, just a dude, son of man, just a guy of men, just a kind of a man. But there was this enigmatic son of man in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter seven, all throughout Ezekiel's gospel, or Ezekiel's uh, prophecy. He, he refers to himself as the son of man. Ezekiel, God talks to him as the son of man, just a dude. You're just a dude, you're just a dude. But there is the dude, there is the son of man. And listen to this. Son of man, this is God speaking to Ezekiel, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. These are the scribes and the Pharisees in the first century. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, you should not, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They'd wander all over the mountain on every side of the high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. But now, there's a son who is seeking what is precious to God, who is confronting the leaders of his day for the way that they're treating people that's actually driving them away when the heart of God has just come home. Just come home. Just come home. I got lost at Disney World when I was like uh, nine, nine years old. So we, uh, we got to go to Epcot Center on a field trip. That was my trip to Disney as a child. So our homeschool co-op went to Disney World and uh, it's all big families, lots of kids. And so I was the second oldest. And so when you have a big family going to Disney with just mom, no dad, and you got all these little kids running around, the older kids are helpers to mom for the kids. Anybody going to a big family know what I'm talking about? And yet all my friends from the homeschool co-op were there, and so I was there at Disney with my friends and my family, and my friends didn't have lots of younger siblings, and so they were able to like go off and do stuff together. And so we're eating our little lunch, and I've been with my family all day, and so my, I'm looking at my mom, and I'm like, can I go with them? I don't want to, eh, no, I don't want to. Can I? And she was like, I need your help. I can't handle this. I need you. And so I was like, ah. Oh. So I went and told them, I can't go with you guys. I got to stay with the family. And then I go back to my mom, and she saw how dejected I was. And so after a few minutes, she was like, you know what? I'll handle it. You just go, you go with your friends. Yoo! Which of course, when you're nine years old, you're like, I'm out. And so I ran off to where my friends were. When I got there, they had already left. And so I was like, okay, where, where do they go? And so I'm looking for them. And now I'm like, wait a second. Now I'm at Disney alone. Don't see them. And so I'm like spooked a little bit. You're not, I'm nine years old. I run back to find my mom and my siblings and now they're gone. And so now I can't find my friends or my family and I'm at Disney, my one shot, and so I started just riding rides. <laughs> and you know what I realized about rides? They're not fun alone. And I was not having any fun, but I didn't want to miss my chance to go on rides at Disney. You can go on a lot faster, single rider. And uh, so I was going on rides, and I realized I didn't, I didn't want to be alone. I wasn't made to be alone. I didn't want to spend the time alone. I didn't want to, like, you know, you're on a ride. Yeah, look over, empty seat. Oh, okay, you know. <laughs> so... So I was like, I got to find them. And so I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, I can't find anybody. And then it, it, I had this moment that kind of hit me where I went from like, like lost to like frantic lost. And the moment I became frantic lost was the moment I realized because my friends thought I was with my family, my family thought I was with my friends, no one was looking for me. You want to feel really lost? When you get to that moment where you realize nobody cares. No one knows. No one's coming. That's what real loss feels like. So I don't know why bad things happen. I don't know why God lets things happen, why bad things happen to some people and not others. I don't have a clue how this all shakes out. But I do know that God will let you come to a place where you feel that lost. And you may have people all around you 
but you're alone. And you may have all the money you need, but you got nothing. You may have tons to do, but no meaning. And it's at that moment that you need to hear a good word about the Son of Man who came to seek and save the lost. There's somebody looking for you. Do you know that? doesn't matter what kind of situation you're in. There's someone who knows your name, who's coming your direction and wants to come into your house, into your heart. He wants to rule and reign and to save you and to change your life forever. And his name is Jesus. Just come home. Just come home. You can always run to him. It doesn't matter where you are or what happens. It doesn't matter if you're the far off lost, the rebellious lost, if you're the near lost, if you grew up in church, but it, yeah, it's not real for you and it's all a fake and a facade. It's behavior modification. If you've learned to say the right things and not say the wrong things and do the right stuff and you're living the double life and you think, everybody thinks things are a certain way and you're very close, but you know something's missing, he's seeking you too. He went after the older brother just like he went after the younger brother. He came to seek and save the lost. And it's, it's interesting because it's actually the Pharisees and the scribes who were the shepherds of Israel that God spoke and prophesied against through Ezekiel. He's saying, you're supposed to be the ones seeking them out. You're supposed to be the ones drawing them in. You're supposed to be the ones who have the Father's heart. Just come home. And instead, you're ostracizing them. Instead, you're taxing them. Instead, you're pulling from them and taking from them for your own well-being and your own benefit. You're creating a class system so you can feel good about you and look down on them. You're feeding off of them instead of feeding them. And this is the picture. In fact, they were meant to be the saviors. And this is what Israel was. I mean, you read the Old Testament. All of the hope of the whole world was in God's choice of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who becomes Israel, his sons and the nation, and a king that would sit on the throne. This is where the hope of the world comes from. But it turns out the saviors need saving. That's a terrible feeling. You ever gotten picked up by a tow truck only to have the tow truck get a flat? Now you're both stuck. This is the situation Jesus comes into. The saviors need saving. But he is the son who will seek and to save. In this passage, and I'd love for you to read 15 to 19, you'll see of all the things that people tend to hope in. Jesus, uh, through Luke's eyes, is making these points that riches can't save you. Money will never save you. We, we think it will. We think money fixes everything. And there's a lot of things it can fix. They say money can't buy happiness, but there's a lot of things you can buy that make you happy, but it won't make you happy forever. So Jesus attacks riches. He goes so far to say that the rich can't be saved. We get the parable of the dishonest manager. Jesus talks about what we should do with our money in order to make a home for ourselves. The rich man in Lazarus, where Jesus turns everybody's perspective on its head. Lazarus ends up in heaven, and the rich man is in Sheol. Jesus likes to talk about how you get money, how you use money, and how you feel about money, but he says, listen, it's not the rich that are saved, it's the needy. It's the people that recognize what they lack, not who boast in what they have. And when you come to Jesus, you come going, I need help. He goes, I know, that's why I came. But I came to give you everything you need. He wants everything you have, but he came to give you everything you need. And so it's not the rich that are saved, it's the needy. It's not the rulers that are saved, we think it's power. We think if we have power, if we have control, if we get things our way, if we become the boss, if we own our own business, if our spouse does what we tell them to do, if the kids would just listen and obey, if we could just uh, have that position, priority, it, power will answer it. If I, could just, if I could just decide and people would do what I say, then the world would be okay. But Jesus says that's not how it works either because it's not the rulers who are saved. Being a ruler doesn't actually change your heart or change your world. Power is just like money, can be used for good or evil. It's not the rulers that are saved, it's the recipients. Jesus talks about the unworthy servants. He says, you don't go serve all day your master and then come in and he says, make me dinner. And you say, oh, well, hold on a second. Let me take a shower and get cleaned up and do my thing and then we'll talk. No, 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 no. You serve the master and then when you're done, you don't say, look what I did, I'm so great. No, you just say, I'm just a, I'm just a servant. He says, it's the recipients. It's the ones who recognize all powers from God. We're just all delegated authority. Any position he puts us in where we have any power, it's just his, and he wants us to use it for the good of other people, not to use it to feel better about ourselves. It's not the rulers that are saved, it's the recipients. And then he points to the religious. He says it's not the religious that are saved. He tells a story of the, the Pharisee and the tax collector. They come, in, they come into the temple to pray, and the Pharisee says, God, I thank you I'm not like these people. He imagines his nose high, his eyes closed, solemn face. I don't know why everybody that's so religious has to look like they're in pain when they're praying. <laughs> you know? So I thank you, God, you didn't make me like these 
peons down here, these, ugh, like this guy, this filthy tax collector. And the tax collector won't look to heaven, beats his chest, says, forgive me, sinner. Jesus says, it's this man that goes home justified, not this one. Why? Because God's looking for humility. He's looking for dependence. He's looking for reception. He's looking for faith. He's not looking for you to boast. He's not looking for you to show everyone how great you are. It's the humble. It's the recipients that are saved. It's funny, this whole section ends with the story of the blind beggar. He's the only person that knows Jesus. Jesus, 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 shut up. You're ruining the moment. Jesus! (laughs) The only person who really sees who Jesus is is the blind guy. (laughs) He asks Jesus, what do you mean to do if Jesus stops? What do you mean to do for you? Can I have my sight? Sure. Boom, you can see. Turns out he could see before that though because he could see who Jesus was. So the question is, how do you see you? How do you see you? Luke wraps up chapter 18 with this interaction with Jesus and a rich, young ruler. And so he's got the power, he's got the money, he's got the status. But how he sees himself and how Jesus sees him are totally different. Verse 18, a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Isn't that a funny thing? How many of you guys are getting an inheritance? Don't raise your hand. (laughs) What do you have to do to get it? You're like, I don't know, not screw up too bad. I don't know, like, how do you get written out? You don't do anything to inherit, do you? It comes to you through the family line. And yet he's got a religious impulse. He's got the power, he's got the wealth, he's got the religious impulse. But Jesus says, it's not, it's not the riches that save, it's not the, it's not the rulership, it's not the power that saves, it's not the religion that saves. You can't get yourself there. And so Jesus goes after that. He says, why do you call me good? How do you know I'm good? He's saying, you know, you think you're good. He says, no one is good except God alone. I hear Jesus is implying his true nature. He says, you know the commandments. Jesus is talking to the rich young ruler. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Bear, bear false witness. He gives him a little rap sheet on the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. The ruler says, all these I have kept from my youth. <clears throat> Done it. Check. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you lack. This guy's missing nothing. He's bankrolling, he's got all the money, all the resources, he's got all the power, he's in a position of rulership. He's kept all the rules, he's got religion, resources, ruler. One thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. What you lack is having your treasure in the right place. You know what Jesus is saying here? I have a home for you in heaven, just come home. Oh, you can't bring that with you. But you can send it ahead. But how do you see yourself? How does Jesus see you? Hmm. So what do you do now? The real emphasis of this passage is no matter who you are, where on the spectrum you exist, God's heart, his call to you is just come home. Just come home, just come home, just come home, just come home. And this means God will save anyone And this has some implications. I don't know if you thought about this or not. If God will save anyone, he will save people not like you. He will bring people into his house that think different than you, that have different priorities than you, different beliefs than you. We've got to work really hard. I have to work really hard not to let the things that are about me separate me from the people who are not like me when all of us are being called home, when all of us are sons and daughters of God. There's plenty of things that separate us, but can we, can we just proclaim for a minute what it is that makes us the same? And that is we have one Father, one Lord, one baptism, one Savior whose name is Jesus. Without him, none are saved. Doesn't matter what angle you come from, where you've been, what happens to you, how you think, what your worldview is, what's important to you, how you vote. What matters is, have you come home? Have you come home? Have you come home? And until we can be a place where everyone's welcome, everyone can come to God at any angle, from any distance, but we all have the heart of just come home. But I don't look like you. Joe, just come home. But I don't think like you. Just come home. But I I, I don't come from where you came from. Just come home. You see, and it goes beyond that. We want to have that receptive heart. But you know that God has called us as the church of Jesus to be the seeking, saving ones. Do you know that? You see, he's done the substitutionary work none of us could do. None of us can save another person. But now we hold the news, the good news of great joy for all people. Remember Christmas? And so we are called to proclaim the message. And the message is, no matter who you are, just 
come home. Just come home. And that can be a very confusing signal when people come home and then we go, not like that. No, 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 don't say that. No, no, don't do that. So this is one of the reasons around here we say trajectory is more important than proximity. Trajectory is more important than proximity. As long as Jesus is at the center of everything and you're headed in his direction, it doesn't matter how far out you are. Do you know that? And we need to have that all the time because we get focused on externals. We get focused on things where we're different. It's really important. You, uh, you look at people, and it's funny, we had our candlelight service, um, Christmas Eve, beautiful candlelight service. It's funny how people can be ostracized in the church for smoking cigarettes. At the candlelight service, you're very popular. You're the only one with a lighter. <laughs> but it's funny, I, you don't want to ask, you don't want to judge someone's relationship with God by whether they smoke. Because you, if you get to know somebody, you might find out what they used to smoke. <laughs> and they're making forward progress, you know? You see that? Because trajectory is more important than proximity. Some of us grew up so close to center, we were just taught how to be. And so we never did the big sins and we never did the, the public things and we never went off and had a scandalized past. We were just always kind of like right here. And yet we can have just as much religious lostness as somebody who's coming from far away. And so when we exist as the people who say, just come home, we also have to live that. We also have to say, you can think different than me. We can have differences of opinion on anything non-essential, as long as we're all having Jesus at the center and moving in his direction and inviting everybody to come in his direction. That's what it looks like to be the church of Jesus. This is why we sing, and I think are so profound a perspective of ourselves, amazing grace. How sweet the sound has saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Well, um, growing up, when I turned 16, I was really into fixing cars with my dad. And um, he, had a, he worked in a body shop, and so I, I was fixing up this car. And I, we, I mean, we did the whole entire thing. Engine, transmission, took whole interior out, rebuilt the whole interior, painted it, body work. The thing was, it looked beautiful. It was, a, it was a 1984 Chrysler Laser worth about six bucks. And uh, throw, the throwaway car of the 80s, it was literally decomposing in the driveway. But I loved that car. And I had it just the way I wanted, and I had one sticker on it, one sticker, and it was a surf brand, and it was called Lost. Anybody remember Lost? Dot, 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 Lost. And here is Jesse Jarvis driving around in his sports car, one sticker, center, back window, dot, 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 Lost. I was close, but very near. I grew up right there. My heart was not with God. My heart was with my car, my heart was with my hobby, my heart was with my future, my heart was with my wealth, my heart was with my identity, all the things I wanted to be. I was as lost as you could possibly be with very few giant behavioral issues. And here I was driving around with a proverbial sticker on my window describing my actual condition. I remember after having an encounter with God and I experienced his welcome, not just to come home, but to have him as number one and everything else had to come down a notch and then he just started reorganizing the order. He has to be in one and then everything that was one through 10 is now two through 11. And at that point he starts rearranging. Nope, 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 eight should be two. You see, you see, seven should be three, four needs to be at 47, that's gotta go, right? And this is the work that God does, but as long as we're keeping him in number one, that means we're having our trajectory in the right direction. And so we want to be a place where you can be free to, to rearrange, to, to beyond. We're just keeping Jesus as number one. Just come home. This is what we exist to proclaim. This is what we did when we take the Lord's Supper. We're proclaiming the death of Christ until he comes. I'm going to close this year and this uh, service and this sermon and this series out uh, in an unusual way. So I have a, it's a song, it's a spoken word. It's a different genre than a lot of you are used to hearing. And we're going to listen to it in the dark, which is weird. But it expresses the heart of God and the activity of Jesus and the role of the church of Jesus and what we're trying to be and who we're trying to follow. And I just want to ask you, while you're listening, to consider for a moment, are you found? Because near is not found. Do you know that you have someone who knows your name that's seeking after you? Maybe just because you're far, you think you're gone forever, but you're just lost, but someone's seeking for you. And so whether you're far or near, if you cannot say definitively, I am found, I am, 
I, I belong to God. He has saved me. I am his. He is number one in my life. I'm living for him. I am working on the order, but I'm having him at the top. If, if there's any doubt in your heart, no matter how close or far you are, as you listen to this, I just want to plead with you to consider that Jesus knows your name and is seeking you out right now. And today is going to be the day where you just come home. And what you will find is a church filled with people who will with joy celebrate your movement towards God and who will come alongside you even with our various differences and disagreements, our distinctives, and say, God is number one. Everything else is an order problem and we're working on it, but we can do this together. Amen? Let's close our eyes. You guys can cue the video. I saw the look in his eyes. He was searching for a prize, worthy of his strength, worthy of his life. In a world full of shiny things, hope that he'd see his name burning bright up high in the city night. And that's when he came to me. Father, won't you give me what is due to me? I gotta go now, time for me to get out of this small town, time for me to live my life, my way, my dreams, it's my right. I know that I gotta dance with the city and own the night. Gotta find someone pretty and toast the wine. Gotta live for the moment, gotta get what's mine. I gotta live for the moment, I gotta shine. I stood right beside him, watched him pack his things. Watched him walk out the door with his hopes and dreams. I pray my best prayer for him every night I sleep. I pray my best prayer for him, yet my soul it weeps. Day after day and week after week, I can still hear his laugh and I can still hear him speak. I remember the day that I had a son. I remember our joy and I remember our fun. Weeks turn to months and months turn to years. The hope of my thoughts now consider the fear. Wonder if he's doing well. Maybe he's found a girl. Maybe he got stuck in jail. Maybe he's been shot and killed. I don't know, but I'd give all that I own just to hold my son again. The tears and the blood that I spent. The nails in my hands and my wrists. To cover the sin and the pain that you're in. To give you my peace that you might love to repent. I place a kiss on his cheek and a crown on his head. Just to know that my son's not dead. And if you spend all your gold and you're lost in your cold, just come home. Just come home. Come home. Just come home. going to have a closing song, but I just want to remind you that none of us can do for anyone else what Jesus has done, but all of us carry the news of what Jesus has done, and all of us are meant to have the heart that Jesus has. He has attained salvation for all of humanity, and he has it to give to anyone who would receive it, who will put down their riches or their rulership or their religion and receive salvation freely and just come home. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you're here and you know that you may be near but you're not in or you feel very far off, that you are in a safe place filled with people that want to see you right where God wants you and that is home. And this is where this is all going. Revelation 7, 9 to 10. After this I looked. This is a vision of the future. Behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. God has a gift for you this Christmas weekend. It's salvation, and it's yours to be received. Amen? God, I pray for every person in this place, Lord, that we would take a heart inventory, and this, the last Sunday of the year, anyone who is in any way distant or disconnected would take the step out of their own seat and to this altar 
to leave with you that which we've been holding to receive that which you're ready to give. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Let's, let's stand.